This conference will now be recorded. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to the RTD Accountability Operations Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Dea Zvala, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, rather than do introductions, I'm going to ask that folks um, please type in the chat your name, organization that you're representing, and if you are a member of the, co the committee, if you wouldn't mind indicating that as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and walk us through the agenda briefly. So first order is the meeting summary from October 21st. Um, I am going to just check in with the committee members to see if there's any questions or clarifications that we need um, to offer regarding the meeting minutes. So, folks have any questions, comments? All right, hearing none. Um, so we'll go ahead and move uh, move into the informational items. I am going to turn it over to Matthew, who's going to provide us an overview of the current RTD affairs structure and task programs before we turn over to a discussion among the committee members um, on the affairs structure and our next steps. So, Matthew. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Great. Uh, yes. So, uh, um, I hope that everyone had a chance to go through uh, the materials uh, before the meeting because I am just going to provide a very brief overview. Uh, certainly, um, you know, can answer any additional questions. I, I, I see that there's some RTD staff on the line uh, if, if there's something that I'm, I'm unable to answer. But um, so just a brief overview on the uh, fair structure and pass program. So, uh, there, there was a past program working group a couple years ago. Um, uh, our, our very own Doug Rex uh, served on that uh, past program working group. And uh, on your screen is a, a summary of the, the working group's recommendations uh, to try and simplify uh, the, the, the um, uh, once even more complex um, past program and fair structure. Um, uh, it, it's still it, it's still potentially uh, uh, complicated. I've I've heard many um, people say that. Um, so so there there is a, a summary of the recommendations that came out of it. Um, these are the fair options. Uh, so uh, one of the changes that was made is uh, the three-hour cash pass uh, cash pass um, uh, instead of just paying uh, cash for uh, one trip on uh, the bus or or light rail. Uh, this was partly done uh, to remove transfers, uh, which made it a little bit uh, easier. Uh, so there weren't any disputes on on time limits, on transfers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it just was a solid. You're you're getting three hours of transportation, regardless of of how many uh, transfers you make. And so the fares. Are currently uh, uh, three dollars uh, for local, five twenty-five for regional, uh, ten fifty for airport. Uh, but discounts can be uh, discounts are offered for bulk purchases. So uh, three out th those prices over uh, those fares listed are for a three-hour pass, but you get a discount if you uh, purchase a monthly pass. For example, uh, here is. Uh, the RTD fair zones. Uh, I can get it bigger. Um, uh, is it not working? Well, everyone has seen this. It's also in the packet, but just wanted to um, show you that there's, you know, there's those distinct fair zones that that go with the uh, different fair costs. So depending on where you're traveling and how many zones you travel through, um, you, uh, you, 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 you pay the, the fare accordingly. Um, with that, I was just meant to be an overview. Uh, so happy to take any questions. And like I noted, there's also uh, RTD staff in the meeting that uh, if there's a um, question I can't answer, but um, that's about it. Thank you, Matthew. So I'm going to open it up to the committee uh, before we move uh, to discussion. So are there any questions, comments, 
um, regarding the fair structure that you all would like answered at this time. Uh, Day, I have one. Go ahead, Crystal. Um, actually, um, let me see if I can scroll down to it. Uh, in the packet, there was the revenue statistics matrix, um, and it has one of the line items of college passes. I just wanted to confirm that that was um, universities, like our, the client that's purchasing those passes are primarily university partners as opposed to individual students. Um, can, do, do we have an answer on that one? Matthew or a member from RTD. Uh, I see Troy. Thank you, maybe. Troy. And, well, I'm sorry. Go I, um, go ahead. I'll be right back. Go ahead, Troy. I'm not, okay, I'm not sure how it's set up, but I know that uh, my son just recently finished his degree at Metro State, <laughs> and uh, he did have a, a student fee for the pass but it was discounted fairly significantly. I bet there's some people here that know um, a little bit more, but I think there's a sharing mechanism there. But it's my understanding, Crystal, that they uh, it's part of your tuition. It's included with the tuition and every student gets one as part of a, a DU. I know that's the way it is at DU. It sounds like what Troy just said is that's the way it is at Metro as well. So it's part of the tuition is assigned to a, a to a college pass to use trans RTD Transit uh, for uh, uh, even um, I can't think of all the names. There's more colleges that I can remember. We we had an eco pass. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just, I guess, it, uh, just trying to get a better understanding of like where that cost is passed down to. I mean, if it's absorbed, you know, I guess the cost sharing, if, if there's a specific fee, um, I work in higher ed as well. And we have had so many conversations around declining um, admission. Uh, you know, I, I do a daily search on higher ed news. Um, just to kind of keep apprised of what's going on and there's a lot of consolidation of universities so you know again just getting more context but um maybe uh that's sufficient I, for now i think lynn may have some more input but it seems to me lynn we had 10 or 11 institutions that participated uh with us um so there, there's more than you might think does that yeah, sound right lynn it, yeah, if Heather's on, she would know this very well, but um, it's basically what, what Jackie said, except it's part of the fees. And uh, the different schools, I think, the campuses deal with those differently. I think, if I have this right, Auraria, um, anytime they change the fees, they have to go back to the students to vote. Uh, if um, at CU Boulder, at least, uh, if there's a, more than a 10 change, in the fees and i'm not sure if it's overall fees i think it is and they have to go back to the student to vote um and i'm not sure about the other schools if they're somewhere individual students you see I'm that sure barbara barbara, her. barbara will have it <laughs> barbara um so yes um uh director geisinger you're correct um however i do know that there are some schools that ha that did not review and renew um, after uh, COVID. So I can get that final number of where we are right now from Heather, but it is reduced from the number that you just spoke to. Yeah, Auraria hasn't uh, renewed for this year. Um, and they've offered, you know, they have made an offer for next year based on uh, some of the lowering of the costs. Uh, it's a 23% credit based on the fact that we had three fairs for a while this year um i'm not sure what what the other uh, it, what the rest of the offer consists of but Arari has that's right area has not um signed up for this year if we could get that um information barbara that would be great as far as the number of uh of colleges universities that have um either renewed or declined to renew for 20 
21, that would be great. And then if you have a sense, the other, uh, I will take kind of facilitator privilege here. Um, if you have a sense of the number of uh, businesses that have also declined or reduced their eco passes uh, for 2021, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the committee regarding the fair structures and or the revenue? As far as the discounted uh, fares for seniors, disabled, um, Medicare, 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 my program is different. Is that the same amount or are there different rates for each of those uh, populations? Is it is it one price? For, you know, the C, is the senior rate the same as the this disabled individual rate as the Medicare rate as the age 16 to 19 year rate or are there different ones for each of them? The, I can, I think I can answer that one. Um, the youth rate is 70%. It goes through age 19, I'm pretty sure. And um, uh, the low income, the live pass is 40%. I believe all the others that you asked about the um, uh, for people with disabilities and seniors. I know the seniors is at 50%. I'm pretty sure um, all of those are at 50%. And you may Federal have recalled law that we've had um, you know a number, several thousand people uh, turned away from the live program because their discount as youth or senior or other was more lucrative. So they were better off with that discount as opposed to the to the lead one. I'm sure many of you were aware of that, but just threw it in. And the live program, just as a reminder, that is income qualified. So it's folks at 185% of the federal poverty level, which is for an individual right around 24, 25,000 a year. Right. So I guess there's a part of me that it just, you know, from a simplicity standpoint, would it make sense? And that's, we're moving to the next phase yet. So that was my question. Are they all different rates for those? I knew the live was different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Federal Jackie. law requires uh, a 50% discount uh, for older adults, uh, 65 and older, and uh, individuals with disabilities. So right. RTD is required to, to provide Offer that. that. I guess a question that I, I have, um, and maybe Lynn or Troy can answer this, is that I remember at one point there was a nonprofit pass that uh, existed intended to support those that were um, really at the, at the fringe that did not have income. Um, I'm curious, does that pass program still exist and what does that uh, take look like? Troy, you want to talk? Well, I don't think that one exists as it formally did. Um, maybe that's another one for Barbara. I don't recall in my almost two years hearing of that one still being in, in existence. Lynn? I think that's right. It, um, it used to be discounted passes through the nonprofits, and I think that ended in December um, and isn't happening now. Yeah, this Barbara. is Barbara McManus. Um, it is uh, all of those folks were phased out and are running through the LIVE program now. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, and another follow-up regarding the zones. How uh, are the zones established? So, you know, you've got the local rate and the regional rate. What, what what distinguishes between whether you're going between one and two zone one and two rail fare zones and or or traveling into a third or beyond for me that's gonna gonna require i'm looking to see who's on here if uh um jesse carter who manages uh service or or no, um natalie is on the line she might be able to handle that yeah right i thought i saw she left but are you there natalie well, you, 
if you can't answer right now sorry just one yes i am um i'm going back and forth because i'm also run cutting <laughs> sorry repeat the question again because i was doing two things at once well three listening trying to listen here and doing two other things <laughs> <laughs> typical woman, typical woman. So, all right, I I, I was curious uh, how you establish the zone, the geography of the zones. So, you know, you have the regional fair and you've got the local fair. So I've heard a lot of complaints about that. Uh, why am I not in the local fair? Why is it a regional fair? Um, so that that's my question. Yeah, those distances were actually established. Um... <laughs> by marketing. <laughs> um, and honestly, I cannot tell you exactly what those distances, why those are the specific distances. I mean, it's obviously from downtown, um, certain distance and then further out, but um, it does have to do with the rail system being the underlying network and being the guiding um, network for those zones. And then the bus is overlaid on that system. Um, we've had internally challenges with that setup, and we've, from service development's point, we've had conversations with marketing and others um, because we think it is confusing and not necessarily makes sense in all cases. Um, but at this point, we have not prevailed, obviously. <laughs> so Barbara, I see you have your, Barbara and then Ron, and then we'll move on to the next topic. So um, I know that uh, Bill Van Meter and the planning group uh, did a lot of work on uh, the different fair zones as well. And in, the in a library that we have at the board office, um, I have a document that explains that, so I will get that to the group. Could we get a summary of it, Barbara? <laughs> is um, there a it, summary? It, it, it pretty much is a snapshot. It's yeah, not the whole right. thing. <laughs> All right. And it is, based off of the, it is based off of the Fast Tracks network as a whole. Okay. Yes. That, that's, the, that's the original. And again, the rail being the underlying network with bus overlay, which so Ron, obviously creates challenges. Like I want yeah, you guys to know this is the reason I've been riding the bus and the train lately. Is so I can get some sense of how all this stuff actually works. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's not real popular system for many of us, uh, as you might imagine, because it tends mm -hmm. to be a bit confusing to to uh, Mayor Malays and other people's points. So that's one we'd be happy to yeah. tackle. Um, and, and I'm not sure if it's us or the finance side, but I do think uh, I, I, maybe we punt it to them. But I do think taking a look at these zones is uh, would be uh, of value. And again, it might make sense to look at it differently. I know we want to simplify the fares, yet the rail network is quite different than the bus network, especially when you're looking at, at the distances and the, just of stations. Um, and, and perhaps the FF as BRT would in this case fall within to more of the rail um, network. Uh, but, you know, the bus, local limited express, we don't really have express anymore, but um, those type of services are, are definitely different. And perhaps, you know, again, and this is service development has argued this for a long time that, um, we should look at those two differently. So I I want to just jump in really quick as a reminder, Ron, I know you had something to add. So part of the reason why we are focused on the fairs and why we're having this conversation is that our charge as the operations committee is to assess and make recommendations on how the fair and past program can be improved to increase ridership. So it really is that relationship between um, ridership and the fair structures. And what is it? What's that root? um issue that we are finding or that we need to make a recommendation on so that's really what we want to get to and the purpose of, of us discussing this today i know that we probably need to unpack quite a bit of this a little bit quite a bit more um, to be able to have a firm recommendation um, by the end of this year but 
um, we're we're certainly headed in the wrong in the right direction. Ron, you had a, a comment. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, Mayor Malay, we'll we'll certainly take a look at that report and summarize it if necessary. I I, I think Dea, you're absolutely right. There's a there's a linkage here. There's an operational impact and a financial impact. The finance committee definitely should look at the finances, and I think we need to think through how can we do the analysis of those trade offs. How much how much potential ridership in, increase is there in simplifying simplifying the fare structure, making it easier to use the system, and how much can that offset sort of a reduction in fare revenue, or how much fare revenue might you actually lose, if any, or or if you increase ridership actually gain overall fair revenue. So I think it's a good linkage between the two subcommittees and kind of two sides of the same coin to look at. Yeah. Again, to add to that, um, it would be interesting. And I, I don't have the numbers um, on that, but what then are the, the ridership combinations? So if you look at these different fair zones and you look at rail, what is the ridership on rail? When you look at these fair zones, how does it affect it? what is the ridership on local um on the bus side where the distances are much shorter often and there are more transfers occurring than on the rail and then what is the combination piece right, so there are three aspects to it and that's why it is so complicated sure but isn't isn't there a trend among transit agencies around the country to kind of be agnostic about what part of the system you're using and just having a fare. If you're gonna if you're gonna ride the system, you pay the fare. You get you get on. And I know when I lived in Portland, you know TriMet TriMet used to have his own system. It was really complicated. Uh, it was really hard to understand. And a few several years ago, they went to a very simple fare structure. If you're gonna ride the system, you pay this amount of money. Your transfers last for a certain period of time. It doesn't really matter how many mm -hmm. transfers you make to complete your trip within that time period. So I do see. Right. Right. I'm gonna make yeah. a quick comment about that so um and then i'm going to move us on so as far as the the structure itself um mile high connects was part of the past program working group and i do remember that being part of the discussion um if you were if you all are really interested as part of this committee i believe back in like a october of 2017 is when uh, we would have received the past program working group um, received peer uh peer reviews of for example houston which is another system that is all one flat fare so there we do have that research and i think it should be available to us as well rut you had a, a comment yeah, i'd love to see that research i'd also say that one of the things we hope to propose to the legislature is essentially relief from the fare box ratio provisions in uh, the current statutes that mostly to give us the opportunity to experiment with some new approaches to fares. Mm -hmm. And I agree, it is it is a remarkably complex yeah. uh, uh, system. And I think a lot of people would have trouble uh, maneuvering through it. Day, I have a, one more ask. Yes, please. Okay, Crystal. so um, in having this discussion, um, you know, made me think of another charge of this uh, subcommittee, and that's the community-based planning um, I don't know if that's exactly how it's phrased, but more community oriented, I guess, partnership with local government. So um, where do we have information on the types of writers, um, on people who use um, RTD services and at what fair price? Do we have information at all um, demographically um, on the types of consumers that use RTD services? I, I'm kind of getting at the, um, I mean, long term, I think, again, how do we work with localities? They want to know um, what kind of demographic they're catering to when, when they talk to developers at transit-oriented um, development sites. Um, you know, who uses transit most, what kind of development should go there. Uh, Matthew, Ron, or, or a member of the RTD team? I don't know if you all are able to answer that for us. I know that RTD has done surveys of their ridership in the past that included demographics. I haven't seen an updated survey in several years now, though. It is my understanding in talking to Jeff, 
Trengrich not too long ago that there's another survey coming and I would and it's a, a region wide survey so I would assume that those statistics are included um, probably would be best whoever would want to contact him directly but I know he's working on that yeah that would be good to get in touch I think that there is there are kind of annual surveys and and there are some demographic information so um, we can uh, I guess Barbara, if you can help us figure out where that is. Yeah, just um, if we, if whoever gets in contact, um, if we can make a note if if that data is desegregated by past type. Mm -hmm. Thank sure. you, Crystal. Just a quick Google. There's a bunch of stuff for those of you who were trying to figure out what to do with your evening as you constantly refresh Twitter. So. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. You're so welcome. I, I'm gonna move us and just to kind of frame that the remainder of the conversation. You know, of course, the the team is here. If there's any additional questions as we start to um, decipher what our immediate next steps are, but just to kind of ground us as a reminder, um, it is our charge to come up with a recommendation or at least something that we want to submit as a. a final package or a recommended package um, by the end of this year. And so um, for the purposes of the full RTD Accountability Committee meeting on uh, the 9th, I would like to at least start out by shaping what our um, immediate charge is as an operations committee. Um, at our last meeting, we went through um, the, the list of priorities that, um, that our co-chairs had developed. Um, and really centered on, as I mentioned earlier, the RTD fairs and past program, but then also recommendations on how to enhance um, service delivery. So again, recognizing that it's really difficult for us to separate these two conversations. How do we have this in, in um, together, not in a silo? And so I think what I'd like to do is shift our conversation. I sent the committee a, um, a list of questions really to just kind of get us thinking about how might we start to formulate some sort of recommendation or where might we want to center some of our energy. Um, so the questions that I sent, which I will just read to you all, um, are well, number one, what would a simplified structure look like? Um, who is the intended audience of the simplified structure? Again, recognizing that there are writers um, that we want to consider, community members that need the transportation. Um, what are the unintended consequences that we might make or that we might need to mitigate in terms of fair structure? Again, keeping front of mind the equity lens that we committed to as an, as an accountability committee um, at the beginning of our charge. Um, the other questions that I had is how, uh, how might a proposed fair structure serve a short-term increase in ridership and potentially long-term increase? I want to encourage us to think about these in two phases. First is the short term, so one to two years, immediate recommendations, and then longer term solutions that we might want to consider. Um, how does the current fare box ratio affect the fare structure, which uh, Rut had lifted up earlier? And then what in terms of fare structure and service operations would require a legislative solution or fix? For example, land use, for example, the fare box ratio, other things like that. So these are intended to really just serve as questions to kind of ground um, your research um, as you were digging through the materials of today. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is just open it up for a little bit more of a discussion um, in terms of it, in terms of the actual fair structure. I've heard a couple of questions already that it looks like we may want to just wipe away or we want to at least under, better understand whether doing away with these three regions might better serve our overall intention of increasing ridership, but I want to just open it up for a little bit more discussion from folks and hear what others on the committee are thinking. Jackie? So I am always a fan of the KISS model, keep it simple, stupid. So there's a part of me that would love to see um, uh, the senior, disabled, all of the discounted fares be at and I recognize the implications associated with this, but just through the at the 50% rate. So instead of having RTD having to create all these different systems and and vet individuals to make sure they meet certain qualifications, and then say no, you're better off in this program than others. If you, I I, I feel like if you got the 50%, 
so youth, I recognize you said they were at 75. So, and, and the lives only gets a 40% reduction. I mean, there's a part of me that would say every discount rate in the short term is going to be the same. And that to me would be a one to two year thing, not a, and, and then evaluate it and then potentially change that. Um, and along those lines, look for a simplification of the, of the local versus the um, uh, regional zones. So th those would be two things I would, I would, I think would simplify the administration of these programs and, um, and I think make them a little more user friendly. If people have to go through the process of having to apply for these things and then be told no, and then it just, I think it discourage is participation. I guess a question that I have for the RTD, for RTD board members and maybe RTD staff members is what is the total cost of administration for impl for operating these types of discounted passes? Because my assumption is that folks have to go into, well, at least pre-COVID, would have to go into RTD, get their photo taken, get all of the necessary paperwork established. It just seems like from a cost management, internal cost management, what, what does that cost to even operate the discounted passes? Oh. I can. I, Troy, did you have something to say? Go ahead. Um, uh, I think that that in the past is that the people can apply online and upload a photo. That has proven to be um, appears to be. I shouldn't say proven to be, but uh, it looks uh, to me to some of us like um, that's a problem with the with the live program. You know that there are people who may not have. Um, uh, the data and be able to, you know, to upload a photo. Um, and, uh, but, I, you know, I, I think that's a very good question is what the, the administrative costs are. I was, I asked some of these questions earlier in the week and, and uh, you know, was told that the, the youth number, the 70% was um, something that uh, staff felt like was difficult to change. It had been, I think, um, hard fought for, but that doesn't mean it can't be changed. It just means, you know, that, um, you know, maybe if, if uh, this committee thinks that uh, that's worth looking at. I've always thought that that having a single discount fare made sense too, but um, there are, you know, there's just so much history there. And uh, they've looked at, at fares all kinds of different ways. And I know that they've done some studies on flat fares, which is, uh, you know, gets into the zones that you're talking about and and um, trying to simplify in those sorts of ways. I think that probably Bill Van Meter is, uh, is the, or maybe Heather, one of them is the best keeper of that information. And before going too far, I guess I would encourage you to have them um, talk about what we know and what we don't know, because then you know, hopefully you can build on that and, and encourage whatever direction you want to go. Yeah. yeah, I'm just, you know, wanting to lift up um, Jackie's point that at the end of, at the end of the day, the administrative cop, the, the administration of just operating multiple different discounts may not necessarily be in the service of the, the writers. Um, and I do see in the comments, I just want to lift this up that it, um, sounds like the finance committee is also lifting up the overhead costs around the complexity. So that's certainly an uh, intersecting point between the two committees. Yeah. Um, Director Geisinger, this is Angie. Go ahead, Angie. Hey, Angie. Oh, hey. hi, Dea. Hey, listen, so RTD partnered with the state uh, to do the input for the LIV program. So anybody who applies for food stamps or whatever, it's the same system. And that was going to be the way that they were going to streamline the way folks were able to apply for the LIV program. Additionally, nonprofits who worked originally on programs for low-income community members uh, have helped LIV participants apply as well. So I know that they worked really hard in trying to streamline it so it wouldn't be so difficult. So I know the city and county of Denver, Department of um, Human Services works hand in hand with RTD to also register folks for the LIV program. Um, it's not perfect, but it, it was the, the easiest streamlining way to start it. But I, I agree with Director Geisinger 
to have um, maybe Heather or someone from her team come and outline that whole administration component. Thank you, Angie. Are there any other thoughts related to the simplification of the fair structure? I think Chris, Crystal, any specific feedback on the direction that we may want to recommend? I'm curious if there's, and I was Googling while we were talking. I'm a sort of obsessive Googler, so I apologize for that. But there's an article, a fair framework, how transit agencies can set fair policy based on strategic goals and fair meaning F-A-R-E. And I think that's kind of an interesting way for us to just generally be thinking about it um, and tying it together. So I wanted to share that. There's also an interesting abstract, and it's 37 bucks to download. But the summary is that in 2003, long time ago, uh, Maryland's Transit Authority um, simplified their fare system, and there was a, a um, resultant increase in ridership and total revenue to the to the Transit Authority from doing that. So my bet is there are plenty of people at RTD who are smart about this stuff, but um, I do think those two things are are really interesting. Um, mm -hmm for that, uh, for b both of those, tying it together with our goals makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, the idea that maybe simplifying it could could make it easier and just have people go more often. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the, for what it's worth. How would folks feel about having the consultants? Because it sounds like that might actually be something we want the consultants to dive a little bit further That'd into cool. around the, yeah. this idea of a fair fair, F-A-I-R. F-A-R-E, yeah. around policy. That could be one of our headlines, fair affairs. There we go. Um, <laughs> no, I guess I would have that simple, too. <laughs> fair and simple, I think. Uh, well, and Ron was talking, this article here talks about TriMet directly, so, um, which I've written a lot. I did a bunch of work in Portland. It's a really pleasant experience there. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage uh, you to look at the passes as well. Um, that's what it, that was my, I was waiting. I was like, because the other thing I want to do is look, well, I, I was like, I didn't want to, Ship, but I think the the passes. Uh, the other program before I, I know uh, we're very excited in the Lone Tree about about the construction of our first low income uh, housing uh, rental property, and as part of that, the each unit is getting a, a pass associated with it. So I'm not sure what pass that is. If that's a neighborhood pass, or if it's because of the income qualifications, if it's a live pass. Um, can anybody answer that question? And then I do want to talk about the past. It's probably, any, it, it, it's probably the monthly pass. I, I know that, okay. that we had a similar kind of thing with two of the affordable housing projects we did here in downtown Denver. And so um, they, the city would allow us, they don't do this anymore, right? Because we changed all of our stuff. But, but they used to allow us to do our zone, you know, to, to reduce our parking count um, if we provided those passes as a matter of course. So there's a little... I, straight line way to buy them but kind of to the to the uh points that have been made about how we streamline processes for for people um i think the idea of having these uh whatever pass it is and if it's just the straight up equal pass i don't think it is i think it's discounted but um available for uh for the property for the low you know as much like was discussed when you have food stamps you get signed up for this well if you're in these uh yeah. housing properties you automatically get uh the passes i think that should be kind of a standard operating procedure for any low-income property within the uh multifamily within the um, maybe not maybe more than multifamily i'm, I'm gonna judge it but anyway i'd like to look at that mm -hmm. and i'd also then like to understand these the the eco pass well i understand the eco pass i think there's opportunity to expand those pass programs or make them accessible to more people and and one of the ones that right now we're looking uh, let me put the my my regional air quality council hat on for a second and one of the things that we're looking at is an employer trip reduction requirement there's they're potentially looking at a state mandate for any employees for, for employers with over 250 people mm -hmm. and i would like to have some kind of a pat like a a pass program available to those folks that are on high transit court high capacity transit corridors with those large employers where they don't all have to buy one will meet the dual goal of air quality and um traffic uh and i just think 
there's a lot of benefits there, but but the past programs, as has been explained to me, are too rigid to get into. I wish we could allow people to buy into a program if they qualify, if they're you know a large employer or if they're part of a nonprofit. Or you, do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. 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 Did you guys by chance see the article in the Times about um, cul-de-sac in Tempe, Arizona? No. It's no, I missed that entire, one. Tell us more. It's so good. It's an entirely car-free community. And when you live there, you have to sign an agreement that you will never park a car for more than um, 12 hours within five miles of the community. But it sits on the Tempe light rail, and it was done in a joint venture with their transit authority. And so it's literally a car-free community, 1,300 homes um all across the price spectrum so yeah this does cool. have to um <laughs> I think that to like an earlier comment that or earlier conversation around um like land use and just like what is it then that we need at the local level to then support this kind of you know high density no car kind of community what is it that for example, a city like Thornton, what what potential tax subsidies would they need to provide or something along those lines? I don't, it's probably something for us to look a little bit closer at. Let me just yeah. be very cautious about any tax subsidy. <laughs> Not we don't have subsidy any probably money. wasn't the right term. <laughs> okay, good. Because I was like, we don't have, we don't assess a property tax and loan tree and we do not have any money to be given away right now. Subsidy was probably not the right term. <laughs> uh, <laughs> forget what I was thinking. Um, right, you had a comment and then Crystal, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah, we, we actually talked about that today in the finance committee meeting and uh, talked about the idea of creating communities that are virtually transit uh, based communities. One of the things a lot of people don't pay attention to, and this was a driver in the Tempe project, we have a house in Chandler. So we, you know, I, I know Tempe a little bit, but the, one of the things that uh, that happens there is the cost of parking spaces. And uh, in the case of a one and a half parking space requirement for a two bedroom, uh, two bedroom uh, apartment or condo, and it's three hundred seventy five dollars a month to the cost of that condo. And so you can build things that are much more attractive and much more attractive, not just because of transit, but also because of cost. Mm -hmm. And so one of the points we made is that all of the constraints in the current legislation, there's a piece about having to get local, having to obey all the local uh, rules and regulations. And, and one of the things there is, is that if you have to deal with all of the local government, it makes it much more complex to get an override on, on uh, parking space ratios. And so that would be a great thing also for us to be able to get relief from the legislature. Mm -hmm. Crystal, you had a comment? Yeah, well, I guess now I have two. Yeah, I, I think on the, the parking, I, I'm all about making it less costly to develop. However, we see, especially in a hot market like we have, that doesn't always translate to more affordable units. So. Uh, if we're going to go that route, I think there needs to be a big fat asterisk that <laughs> that doesn't yield the again tying it back to who who rides RTD is that the type of housing? I mean, again, I'm all about making it low cost, budget friendly. Um, but at what other mechanisms do we have? And being kind of cognizant, working with the municipalities on how do you actually ensure something like that gets put in as opposed to you know, um, other product. And not that I'm against that either, but I really am a fan of mixed income products, um, mm -hmm. housing products. But um, the other thought I had um, was around um, our earlier conversation, and now it's escaping me. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, let me see if I can go through my notes and find that question once again. <clears throat> Hey, Crystal, I'll just let you know that the Colorado, which is a project that our company did right next to Union Station, 334 homes and only 200 of the folks living there uh, have cars. Um, and um, that's a 10% affordable housing ratio also in that project. So 
um, it, it's really interesting if, if just to bore people to death with real estate stuff. If you if you build the garages and parking, people park in them. If you have an, an amenity and a thing that folks like, they will figure out a way to get to it without a car. And so um, there are examples basically everywhere in the world of that. So um, it is a really, it is a very, very intriguing option of, of lifestyle that will be, that is appealing across all um, economic levels. Mm -hmm. the, um, back to Wait. Jackie's. Go ahead, Lynn. Thanks. Um, uh, point about the the new development where they all got eco passes. I think that both Boulder and Angie may know this better than I do, but Boulder for, for quite a while has been requiring developers uh, who for whom a TDM plan is in place. And I don't know what the standard is for that to happen um, to provide eco passes, I believe for the first two years for all of their um, uh, you know, people living there. And I think that Denver's doing the same thing. I'm not sure if it's quite the same program. I love that program. I think it's, it's a great idea. Um, uh, you know, it has to be balanced with, like you say, affordability and everything, but it certainly kicks off the start for people to use the pass. Mm -hmm. I guess a, a question that I have is that, you know, what is the challenge with the NICO pass? You know, we've talked about a yeah. couple of examples around affordable housing complexes and, and other communities that they have just not been able to tap into it, but what is the, like, root challenge to making that more accessible i think i, I can I uh, Daya, mm -hmm. i think i can talk about that because it's been a focus of um frustration it, it's a formula of rooftops that they base the cost on and so um for instance i looked at an eco pass a neighborhood eco pass for the globeville swansea Elyria community it's twelve thousand rooftops and so it's a price per house based on a formula, and it's the cost is just too astronomical. I mean, I think they quoted me something like two million a year. Um, and then, but but we worked with a developer where we were told that if there was a building, they shared a rooftop, and so that becomes a much more affordable formula. So I think that to Rutz, um, you know piece it's a very complex process and i think it, it does need to be streamlined a whole lot more the city and county of denver is now implementing a requirement for tdm for all developers and that's new and that's having an impact um, and it is a parking racial component it's having an impact in terms of providing um, multimodalism and transit passes and stuff where people are actually looking at it and developing strategies to implement them. So I think we're at the very beginning of this. Jackie? I'd like to speak to the, the uh, business side of it as well. I know we, um, uh, Charles Schwab has 4,500 employees in Lone Tree and they don't participate in the EcoPass program because it was too expensive and too rigid a program because it required purchasing a pass for every single employee, even though some of those employees didn't even live on a light rail line. And one of the saddest days as mayor was when I had to approve a second parking garage for Charles Schwab when we were opening a light rail station, you know, 500 or a quarter, less than a quarter of a mile from their office doors. Um, and I think had we been able to, and I kept saying to them, it would be a lot cheaper to do an eco pass program or some kind of a pass program and then they ran into the issue of bureaucracy within their own organization. If they were going to do it for their Lone Tree uh, employees, they had to do it for their San Francisco employees. And then it became this overly burdensome cost. So I think having the requirement that every, you must buy a pass for every single employee is too restrictive. Uh, the other issue I'd like to bring up is something that Kelly Bruff shared with me when VA Corporation was relocating to the uh, Denver area and they wanted on day one to have every um, employee issued an eco pass. And she said it was one of the more, more frustrating, challenging issues for, she's like, we were trying to bring customers to RTD and have them customers on day one. 
and the bureaucracy associated with it was was overwhelming. They ended up accomplishing it, but it was way too hard for what they were trying to do. So I think I think the passes are absolutely a program that could be um, in my kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, simplified. And I'm hearing at least two pieces. I just want to confirm this for immediate, like our immediate action, simplifying the fares, simplifying pass structures, really addressing these kind of root challenges that we're having in terms of businesses, but also neighborhoods. Lynn, you had something you wanted to add as well. Yeah, Angie and I were in a meeting um, this week with, with Heather McKillop, who's the CFO, and Teresa Ranker, who runs the EcoPass program. And I was hearing, I think we were hearing, um, openness, this frustration, I think, there too, in terms of, of uh, some of the administrative um, processes. So, and uh, I think Pauletta was in that too. You know, it's time to start thinking about it. We got to bring riders back. And, you know, thinking about uh, the pass and, and uh, whatever else as a marketing tool, um, I think the time is here. It's a good time to, uh, uh, be looking at it, and maybe it would make sense, um, Daya, for you as as the chair of the committee to you know to start with a, a conversation with us and uh, um, Teresa and Heather to sort of figure out next steps. You know, I like the idea that your consultant might be available to look at this, and there clearly was a lot of consultant work done for the past mm -hmm. program working group. That um, even if that there even if it opened other conclusions that didn't make sense at the time it, mm -hmm. they may make sense now so um that's just a suggestion of a way to go yeah no i think that's a great suggestion lynn and i think if we can take the work of the past program working group which is now i mean realistically three years old we're also in a very different um position <laughs> right we uh in terms of COVID recovery and really just uh shifting the role of rtd in that economic recovery right because rtd as a backbone entity as the transit system is going to have a critical role in the recovery of the region economically whatever that might look like and then of course for sustaining our affordable housing what limited affordable housing we have but preserving that and hopefully making it more accessible yeah. Thank you. Um, I, and I recalled kind of the comment I was going to make earlier, and it was exactly on um, getting a strong understanding of who uses RTD services, who, um, and and kind of aligning that kind of with the conversation around jobs and industry, because you know. And, and then is there potential to tie that to incentives, um, working with municipalities, um, you know, we knowing kind of what industries are most impacted, you know, uh, in an economic downturn and kind of insulating um, our, our RTD against that, or just having a, a plan for another situation like this. Um, again, having that data on who, who rides, what industries they use, and then I guess having a command of who uses RTD services, we can get creative with municipalities um, on what types of incentives to development or et cetera um, that we could offer. Um, I guess, yeah, so so I guess just kind of tying those kind of conversation together on kind of what could be possible. Um, especially when we think about that equity conversation, because TOD sites, in my opinion, um, don't often um, get at equity. I think there are some developers, like Chris mentioned, that um, are willing to, but I think the majority that I work with don't come to the table kind of with that initially. But um, if there could, if we can kind of turn the head um, and just kind of come prepared with that package, I think it'd be more likely um, that we see development that actually houses people who ride the light rail service. So again, there's always a connection with ridership um, in all of the conversations there. Jackie. So just to that point, I think, and this isn't something RTD can do, but I think it is something local governments can do. This, the, 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 the low income community that's opening in Lone Tree is across the street from a light rail station. One of the requirements that the city made was that uh, was, and it's not that much. I will completely own it. Doesn't it's it's a smaller project, but we do have a requirement that um, all of our low-income housing projects that are there is a 
we have a required amount are within a quarter mile of uh, light rail or um, a bus, a high speed bus line. So we, we as the city require that they put them there. Um, and the other thing I would like to the, the body to consider is um, I, I actually think uh, offering free free passes to the college campuses, if we're looking at a short term thing um, in the next year or so as we respond to COVID, I think that is something that should be thoughtfully considered. I do think, um, you know, you know how we all feel about approaching going, being the first people to walk into a restaurant. You, you don't want to, you don't want to be the only one in there. It feels so uncomfortable. You're like, it must not be good because no one is there. There's a part of me that thinks giving those college students free access to, um, and maybe it's just to light rail, maybe it isn't the bus service, but uh, I think we'll create some vibrancy back when we are in our recovery from this and encourage more people to come back to it. And I, I do feel like uh, it also would garner community support. We're supporting the education of the young people that are in our state. Um, I think it serves a multitude of goals and then garner some goodwill with the um, academic institutions that maybe there's a marketing requirement that they have to give um, to encourage light rail uh, usage. So I do think there's something there, if it's not free, super, super discounted uh, is as part of a COVID response package. So. Thank you, Chris. And That's a great idea. I was just going to agree and say, let's do it for the, the other path is too. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it's easy enough for me to say, okay, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> RTD, you know, give everybody, but, but that short term, I love Jackie, the idea of, of, you know, encouraging use. Oh. And I love your analogy of the empty restaurant because I use it in a completely different circumstance. And so really, I think we might share a brain. So I, but I think it's true that that sense of comfort, having somebody there, uh, if I knew 20 people were going to the movie theater, I'd probably be more likely to go for some reason right now, which makes no sense at all, right? But somehow that would make me feel better about it. So uh, I think it's a, a genius idea. And I think it's a nice kind of small stimulus that perhaps RTD has the capability in the near term to, to provide. So, um, but I'm, I, I only got the kind of half listen to the finance committee this morning. So I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fair. I think it's worth um, looking at options. It's a lot of money in those college passes. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it may not be that we need to, we would need to go, might be able to make it a good marketing ploy without, you know, going all the way in terms of, of giving up that money. Um, but uh, the idea of just thinking through these as, as a marketing approach um i think is so, is it. so len you, you inspired in me a, a quick comment too which i do want to say we started with keep it simple stupid and now we got five different passes we all just came up with so right. I, I think we'll all collectively have to kind of balance that um, there, as we think no there if you make them the same price and the same process <laughs> it's not that complicated Good. perfect and yeah. me, the college students free is is different i i really do believe that if you yeah, that's fair. You make that's fair. The same price. Yeah. You make it the same process. Um, you, you qualify if you're a senior. You're qualify. You qualify if you're on Medicare. You qualify if you're between the ages of six and nineteen. If you're at 185 percent of the, is it the area mean income? I'm not yeah. sure that federal uh, poverty level. Double, excuse but me. I thank think you. that's also the challenge, right? I, at least from my perspective, landing on the federal poverty level. Was like was very difficult. Nobody knows the federal poverty level. Folks are more familiar with area median income because that's what affordable housing uses. And so I think that's just going to need to be a, a question to Jackie's point. Like as we think about streamlining everything and making it as simple as possible, like what are we really talking about and what do people actually know? Um, and what metric can we get to that we don't have to create a whole infrastructure of administration to get to too, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Crystal. I will say I think in the near term. It, you know, reducing the price by half might actually more than double the ridership. So I will say that it, it may not do that in the long term, but I wouldn't be surprised in the near term in this in this strange setting that, you know, although I my bus on Sixth Avenue is getting pretty, starting to get pretty busy. Some of the routes are pretty busy. Crystal, and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> um, yeah, quick comments. Um, on the 
affordability piece. Oh, man, I swear I like hang on to it. And then as soon as you're like crystal speak, it just escapes me. Um, one thing, uh, Jackie, to your to your comment, you know, we're, we're talking about how do we support our businesses at this time, I'm sure um, on that goodwill piece and tying it to marketing, uh, coming up with some way to work with like, you know, Visit Aurora or Denver's Visit or, you know, other visit um, organizations to kind of promote and encourage folks um, there could be some coordination amongst the businesses near different light rail stations. Um, so I, I, again, I, I really like that idea because it can just think of so many different um, opportunities to partner um, with the organizations that already exist and have that function in the municipalities um, and have that rapport with, you know, and again, it's, it's all of our bottom line because at the end of the day, when people shop more, Right, we end up capturing that tax dollar, and then we're more likely to pay into the system long term. Thank you. So I know. So we are at time. We are at 401. I'm just gonna quickly just again reconfirm that where we are landing in terms of our potential recommendation to the larger group is um, focusing our efforts on simplification of the structure, the fare and pass structure. Um, considering free, just again exploratory conversation on what free targeted passes looks like or free fare to certain um, populations looks like simplifying the overall just pair the fare structures eco and eco passes um, streamlining whatever administrative or operational um, challenges or barriers currently exist i think from that conversation we will also um, lynn follow up with you on that um, offer to connect with Heather, as well as others to under, better understand what the operational and administrative barriers are. Um, and then eventually, as just as an FYI for the Dr. Cog, we would wanna pull in our consultants to help us in this fair, simple, fair slash path structure, just to build on the work of the past program working group um, to make it relevant to where we are today. One thing that we did not discuss in the operation, we touched on some of the operation um, in our conversation, but one thing that I just want to lift up that was in our um, overall charge is first and last mile deficiencies. I'm going to say that let's put a pin in that and let's kind of, uh, I think one area that we might want just some additional research or information on is what is that, what does that currently look like? If there's some information that Dr. Cogstaff has that maybe they could provide the committee in the interim, that would be fantastic. Um, and then I had so much more on my things, but I think I'm good there. So, <laughs> uh, any last minute questions, thoughts before we, I go ahead and wrap us up? I want to just say thank you, Daya, for the questions that you sent out. That was a very thoughtful email. It was very, it, it kind of framed the conversation. It made me sit down and kind of gather my thoughts and ideas. So that was really great. So your organization of this meeting, I just want to compliment you on that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I took three minutes of your day, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> thank you. Thanks.